Yes. All right. Okay, so this is Susan with Texas Weaver, and she's here to tell us something about weaving materials. And the reason that I'm inspired to do that is a question I get a lot when I do shows is how did it, how long did it take you to make that piece? And the truth is there were many different stages and a lot of people don't appreciate the fact that a lot of the time was spent in the actual preparation of the materials. So I was going to talk about a few different things that I use in my, my uh, art. And I'd start with the pine needles for the pine needle basketry. Um, these are Texas pine needles that I get from my yard. Now that sounds easier than it is, because if I rake these needles up, they break. And um, I would say 90% of the needles in my yard are not usable. So I'm out there picking them up one at a time. <laughs> and these are reasonably long. I mean, they're maybe eight, nine inches if I'm lucky. Um, when I go to basket weaving workshops with other people and they bring longleaf pine from Florida, they're 18 to 20 inches long. So, um, and, and not as thick, each, each slice of the pine needle is not as thick. So it makes for a different weaving experience. Usually I soak my pine needles or actually cook them in an old crock pot with glycerin and then they're bendy. So without having them wet, I can weave them without them being real breakable. And if you weave things wet, at least pine needles, they will shrink so much that your whole piece will be super loose when it's dry and you don't wanna do that. Um, one thing I've learned and is interesting to do is to take, you can dye the whole pine needle with writ dye. Again, you, I boil it in a, with a hot pot outside, um, but I kind of like this partially dyeing. You see the end is still natural. And then what happens is when you make the basket, you can put the color on one side and the natural on the other side, on the inside. So I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of that. One other thing I use in my pine needle baskets that takes a lot of prep time is eggshell mosaic. So that center is actually a piece of wood that has broken eggshells glued to it and then alcohol ink and paint techniques applied to it that have to dry in between. So that's like about a two or three day process to get that ready to go. And then I glue that onto leather and that's what I actually stitch into when I start my pine needle weaving. So again, if you count all that time in the creation of the basket, that adds a lot. And I don't do them. What I do is one day I'll just say, I'm gonna start doing eggshell mosaics and I'll make 10 of them. Um, and then I'll go through that three day process with those 10 eggshell mosaics. And then when I start weaving, I'm doing something else. Another thing I've done with pine needles is actually paint the tips, just the tips, um, to pick up a color. And that's kind of neat. That's a turquoise metallic paint. And you can use that as a, a decorative feature of your basket. So for gourds, the preparation is most of the time. A gourd, and I didn't bring it in the house because a dirty gourd is just covered with black mold and I'm not gonna have that in the house. But picture this whole gourd was covered with black and white mold that I had to get off first. And there are many ways people remove mold from the outside of gourds. Some people actually bury them in dirt and then get the dirt wet and say if that kind of soaks through there and then you can squirt off the dirt and the mold. And a lot of times that works for most of it, but you still have to do some scrubbing to get it off. I normally just put um, dishwashing soap on the outside and wrap it in a wet towel and sit it outside or else I'll put it in a bucket and put a weight on it to keep it down in the water to soak. Um, you have to be careful because if there's any hole in the gourd at all, if you do that bucket technique, you're gonna get water inside the gourd and you don't want that. So then once you've got the outside clean, um, I've got a little saw that I use um, and you see how tiny that blade is. Well, sometimes the gourd is super thick and that blade has to work really hard. But I don't like to use a bigger saw because I'm scared of it. <laughs> I could use a uh, regular jigsaw, but I, I don't want to do that. So I'm using this little saw. The blade is all inside the gourd when I'm doing this. But a lot of times this, the saw gets overheated and, and it can take a long time to just even do this straight cut. And I do some curvy cuts that take longer. 
then once you've cut it, you've got this, and this isn't as, even as dirty and messy as a lot of the gourds. If you think about a pumpkin being all the goop that's inside a pumpkin being dried up and hard, that's what the inside of a gourd is like. So you've got to scrape all this out. And this is what's kind of giving me asthma right now. I usually wear a respirator when I'm doing this. And I'm certainly trying not to kick up any of this in the house. But, <coughs> excuse me, I, I, have a, I have discovered, and the Indians used a shell to scrape the inside. And honestly, that does work the best. I have to wear gloves because I'll be scraping my knuckles too. And I don't, I don't want to do that. But this again, takes a long time. Some gourds, it doesn't take that long. Some gourds, it takes a long time. And after an hour or two, I give up and say, I'm coming back tomorrow because I've had enough of that. Um, when I'm cleaning gourds, again, sometimes I try and do several of them at a time so that then they're ready to go when I'm ready to make a piece. But but I have to kind of know where I'm going with the piece to even know where to cut because sometimes I don't cut straight. Like, let's see, like this one. Um, I dug around my stash of antlers um, to see what antler was going to fit this gourd and not stick out funny. And then I tried to figure, well, if I lay the antler on that like that, how am I going to cut? So then I kind of drew a pencil cut, a rough cut of where I wanted to put the cut and once you get it scraped out then you've got to really sand it on the inside and get it um, quite clean before you can finish it and I finish mine with Mod Podge and acrylic paint um, some people use spray paint they use spray other kinds of spray finishes you know it just it depends whether you want I've sometimes put sand in there and made a rough surface so it depends what you want to do. And this is the outside without any treatment on it. And um, usually after I've finished the inside, then I cut little holes around the top because that's where I'm going to attach my weaving. I don't have a bit in here, but this is my little drill. It fits my hand. I love it. And then I decide, usually ahead of time, I'm, first thing I do is pick my color scheme. I'm going to have a piece of glass or something uh, beading that I'm going to match my color to. And so I'm either going to use acrylic paint, though that's usually by my last choice. I usually use leather dye or alcohol ink to get the colors on the gourd. Here's one that has leather dye. It's been done. I haven't done the inside, but I've done the outside with leather dye. And it, you still have some of the modeling effect of the gourd, which I kind of like, but it evens it out it, and still has kind of a natural look. It sometimes really does look like leather. I like that. And then I'm going to finish the inside. Now I have to decide, am I going to put a base on it? How well does it sit? If it sits fine by itself, I won't put a base on it. But if it doesn't, I'm going to put a base on it first and then finish the inside and plug up the holes I had to drill to put the base on it. Then what I put on the rim is this Danish cord. I um, mean, it actually does come from Denmark. There's one supplier I know of in the US that, that will deliver this to me. And I really like theirs better than some other people's version of this. It's very soft and it's what the Danish people use to make modern furniture. They use it to rush the seats of Danish modern furniture, but it takes dye and it takes a paint. Um, when I put leather dye on a gourd, then I wanna put the same color on my on my cord that's going to go on the top of the gourd because I'm real obsessive about things matching um, and so to get that I have to take a little dauber and dip it in the leather dye and spread out newspapers outside of course and go across this whole thing all the way around and I need many yards of this so that's another process that takes a long time in the preparation but I think it uh, makes a big difference, and I like doing that. Another thing that I use sometimes in my gourd art is um, philodendron leaves. These are actually the sh sheaths at the base of a split-leaf philodendron. If you think about when it dies, it, it has this brown thing. And I have to admit that when I walk through Lowe's sometimes and see these things, 
in the household plants, I go, oh, ooh, there's a sheath. I, they wouldn't miss it. You know, they're going to just pull it off and throw it away. But I actually buy these from a lady in Florida because she, she sells them by the bundle. Um, I soak these in. I don't soak them. I wrap them in a towel with glycerin and water, and they become very leather-like. And um, I think they're beautiful, and I use them on the rim sometimes. Another thing I like to use a lot in my trying to find it is... Uh, here it is. I get this from a guy in Florida too. These are date, this is date palm inflorescence. So these are the flowers coming off of this date palm and then see how long they are. And they're real, they're stiff, but they can be soaked and uh, they just add a lot of really interesting texture. It's, it's one of my favorite things to work with. And uh, last year, I think when we did gallery night at Brit, I had somebody that worked at Brit come up to me and say, you know what you should be using is mully grass, pink mully grass. And I was like, what is that? And he said, I'll be right back. And he went outside and he pulled some of it up and it's beautiful um, grass with plumes at the top. And I have since planted some myself and I, it's probably gonna take a year for me to get enough to weave, but it's a lot like sweet grass. So I'm hoping it's gonna be like the sweet grass that the Gullah weavers use in South Carolina. And even if I use it in my pine needles with like a row of this lighter stuff in with the pine needles, I think that might be interesting. So what's, what else? My antler baskets. I like to use a variety of products in the antler basket itself, in the weaving. Most of this is traditional basket weaving material, which is the core of the rattan vine. And you can buy that from basket weaving supply stores. Um, I also use chair caning sometimes, and you can get that at a basket weaving supply store. But I have in here some of that date palm inflorescence. I've got seagrass. Um, I've got some vine that's in my backyard. I finally figured out what it is. It's called moon seed vine. And oops, got that in the way. And it's um, it's everywhere. It's kind of like kudzu. And so I looked at it and said, it's, I think I can weave with that. So I've been cutting it and, and just curling it up. And after it dries out, then I reconstitute it in hot water. Um, the interesting thing about all the different kinds of materials in a basket like this, because I think it has leather and bark, each, each different kind of thing needs to be soaked a different length of time. So some things you can get them too wet and they'll just dissolve and you really don't want that or they just become shredded. Um, and some things have to soak a really long time before they'll even bend. One of the things I really like to use that date palm inflorescence for sometimes is I'll have a basket that, you know, this is a physics problem. This thing is top heavy. How is it gonna keep from falling over? Um, I can put little feet on it out of that date palm inflorescence and it keeps it from falling over. I like that. I don't do that on all of them. I don't have to. This one I think rests on its tine. So that works. Another thing I like to use sometimes in my baskets is daylily leaves. Now this sounds weird, um, but I have a lot of daylilies and I learned to make this cordage from daylilies. So I take the green daylilies, I split them with a pin and get them kind of evenly into shreds and let them dry. Um, and because if you weave green, it's gonna shrink too much when you go to weave it. So after they've dried, I reconstitute them in a wet towel. And then I make this cordage, which is really, I mean, it's, it's really neat. And, and then I weave that into the baskets. So again, I mean, there was an afternoon making a little bit of cordage to be used and I didn't make all this in one sitting, that's for sure. Um, another thing I forgot to talk about is uh, I finish, it's not really before the process, the process, but after the weaving, I finish my baskets with wax, hot beeswax. So once again, another crock pot was sacrificed. This one was just for hot beeswax. And I brush it on with a pastry brush and it starts to look like a candle and you get all afraid. <clears throat> then I wipe, wipe some of it down and then put it in the oven. And, and literally bake it at a low temperature. And the first time I was taught to do this, I said, that is never gonna work in Texas because it's too hot, it's gonna be sticky, will not work. It's not, it's not sticky, it's just firm. 
Um, so if you have a basket of a special shape, and I don't have one of those, like it's twisty or something, you can really twist it and as it dries, it will stay that way. Um, and it really protects the basket because the, the wax goes in between the needles and it, it helps the basket last for a long time. The instructor I studied with that, um, well, I've been lucky enough to study with several. In the last few years, every time I go on vacation, I manage to take a class somewhere. So I studied with a lady in San Diego a couple years ago, and then I took a, a week-long class at Aeromont School of Arts and Crafts in Tennessee. And we did six days of white knuckle, what I call white knuckle weaving. I mean, we just wove intensely for six days, but I learned an awful lot from that guy. And Aeromont is just the most wonderful experience because down the hall, they're making glass and they're making pottery and they're, you know, they're, it's just full of artists everywhere. And it was just wonderful. And so we were able to use the pottery studio, use their kilns to dry, dry our stuff. Um, so anyway, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Well, yes, as a matter of fact. Yeah, is there anything that you can't weave? Any, well, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, you've shown us an, a huge array of things. So I think that's probably what got her asking that question. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I have studied at um, basket conventions where I purposely took a class with somebody using materials I had never used before, like birch bark or elm bark or uh, cedar bark. And those are very, very expensive materials. But I took the class and wanted to try it out. I, you know, I may never do it again. I've got one that is out of black ash. And I mean, they literally dragged the tree into a swamp and then pounded it to peel back the layers of the wood to get the strips of ash. Wow. So pretty much anything that can bend you can weave it's just are you happy with the way it looks <laughs> that was fascinating i really did enjoy that um i i have a couple of pieces i'll have to disclose of, of susan's and, and have seen her work for a long time and i love it but that's even more than i have learned just bumping up against you over the years oh good i found that very fascinating and this video will be out there that you can watch it again if you want to replay it just remind everybody, if you want to visit the Etsy market hosted by the DFW Etsy Artisans, then you'll get to see some of Susan's works. There's links to her shop, links to some of her individual listings, as well as the other artists that are part of our market. So, um, I let's see, there is one quick question here before we go away. Let me put okay. it up that just came in. Have you ever come across an old neat basket that is damaged and repaired and embellished it with your own weaving? I have not. I have been asked to repair baskets, but honestly, um, that's really hard. You're right that I might take it over and make it my own, but to be able to try, I'm so obsessive about matching things. I'm a real matchy matchy person. And to be not able to match exactly the material they used would bother me. <laughs> So I haven't done that. That's an interesting thought, though. Yeah, well, that's definitely fair. I understand that. Well, again, thank you so much for your insightful presentation. Sure. And, uh, like I said, it's going to be on the Facebook page that you can replay it if you're interested. I, I'm likely to share this with some friends because I... Oh, thanks. Very fascinating. Good. So, thanks so much for joining us. And... Uh,